So good afternoon. My name is Marcelo Larraguibel. I am a board member of Chile Mas. Um, let me tell you a story because I'm very proud to be here today with you, all of you. Uh, this is a story of uh, uh, that we dream in uh, in Chile Mas for long. Um, in 2018, we are thinking of how to link much better Massachusetts with Chile and ha having an impact in a very large number of people in the quality of living of many of our citizens. And we contact and we discover that there was an, an area in MIT, in MIT Media Lab City Science, that were designing cities to be more uh, integrated, to have better quality of life, um, to be more innovative. Um, so we came up and, uh, you know, uh, have a, a contact with the group of Ken Larson in MIT City Science Media Lab and think you know, how we can connect to Chile. And we have the great opportunity to work with Camara Chilena La Construcción. In that time, Patricio Donoso, who is here, the president, got very enthusiastic and we thought, where we can do this? And let's do a region. And we think, we thought about Concepcion, which is one million inhabitants in, in the in the city of Concepcion with many challenges of how to develop the city, many discussions. So how we can contribute to improve the standard of living of one region in Chile and from there to learn and, and to make much better, you know, the cities in Chile and maybe from there to expand to other regions in Latin America. That was our aspiration as, as Chile Mas and also I think the, the, the camera aspiration. Um, and today, all this uh, part of the session, uh, we are going to have uh, Ken Larson and then we are going to talk about what we are going to do in Concepcion because this project is coming to a reality and uh, we are going to work in, uh, in the region of Bio Bio. We have the governor here and we have the people from Bio Bio and from Corporación Ciudades and, and uh, this is starting and it's going to be signed today here in, uh, in, in Boston in Massachusetts. So let me introduce to Ken Larson. He's a director of the MIT Media Lab City Science, and he leads the, did, leads the group that does all the uh, work with cities around the world. Um, so Ken, please, he's gonna share with you some of uh, his thoughts and uh, developments, and then we're gonna talk about more specific about what's gonna happen in uh, this uh, effort in Concepcion. Ken? So it's so great to be here on this beautiful day, uh, see old friends from Chile, and uh, celebrate the launching of the new City Lab in, in Bio Bio. It's fantastic. And I want to thank everybody who worked so hard over the last four years to put this together. So let's give them a thank you. What I was asked to do is just do a, a kind of a quick summary of some of the work that we're doing now. And um, we think of it as hyperlocal solutions to global challenges or optimizing the environmental, social, economic performance of cities. Actually, we usually like to work at the scale of a neighborhood or a community within cities and think of cities as a network of of healthy, high-functioning communities. But let's start with the, the question of, of why. Well, it, that's an easy one for me. This is, this is a, a video I love to show because it, it, it shows young children right before the pandemic, save turtles, not your car, out um, demanding that we take climate change seriously. And I think uh, it's clear that my generation has not done well for these children. We have to do a lot better. So at least that's what's motivating me in large part. Then you ask the question, why cities? This is um, a new report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and there was a quote that I think was very powerful. Urban areas represent 67 to 72% of global emissions. I mean, think about that, 70% essentially of global emissions. How new cities t and towns are designed, constructed, managed, and powered, essentially everything to do with cities, 
will lock in, meaning what we do today is very, very difficult to change, lock in behavior, lifestyles, and future urban house uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we have, we have to address this today. Now, most of the attention is focused on top-down action that governments can, can make, like a carbon tax or decarbonizing the grid, et cetera. We're more interested in the bottom-up action that cities can take and communities and individuals, this bottom-up innovation, community by community. And that's important because cities will be responsible for 90% of population growth. Concepcion is seeing a huge increase in population. Also, 70%, as we said, global emissions, but 90% of wealth creation. So if you want to think about jobs and public health and these other grand challenges, you, the cities is where all the action is. Now, who are the worst polluters? This, this is a list of the worst polluters by country. And this is all CO2 ton per person per year. The U.S. about 15.2. If you believe these numbers, I think they're all higher, actually. Um, <clears throat> but if you, if you read the IPCC report, we have to get down to an average of 2.5 tons per person through 2050. So we're way beyond that. And I don't see government taking action that will seriously address this. Uh, it's a societal imperative to develop a new model for cities. We think it should be a data-driven simulation-based process. So what is our process? So we, we start with insight. This is collecting and analyzing data so we know how things are today. Then we think about transformation. These are those interventions that will improve conditions. It can be design, public policy, mobility, housing, etc. <clears throat> that alone is not good enough. You need to then build prediction models so you can have some confidence that what is being proposed will actually have positive impact. That's still not enough because unless you bring the communities along and reach a consensus as to a shared vision of the future, very little happens in cities. And then finally, we need to focus on governance. And we're particularly interested in self-regulating systems that will create feedback mechanisms to preserve some high performance. So collectively, this is our process. This is essentially our entire city science research agenda summarized. So let me just talk about this area, Kendall Square where uh, MIT is located. So we did a little case study to see what we could do in our backyard. This is um, a, a, <clears throat> a little uh, map that shows all of the amazing ecosystem of companies, startups, large companies, biotech, robotics around MIT. It's really one of the most amazing innovation districts on the planet, but as a community, uh, it's quite dysfunctional. There's very little housing, no pharmacy, very few amenities. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we calculate that in Kendall Square, it's 17.9 tons of CO2 per person. Uh, remember that we need to get to 2.5 tons if we have any chance of keeping global warming below 2, to, two degrees Celsius. 1.5, I think, is already out of reach. Um, so we asked the question, what would it take to get down to 2.5? Is it even possible? So that's what we looked at. And we said, let's focus on those interventions which will simultaneously improve the social and the economic performance of the community. Now, MIT owns now a 14-acre site not far from here. It's the last great chance to transform the MIT Kendall area into a model innovation neighborhood. Uh, so we build what we call CityScope. This is of the Kendall Square area. As you make changes, you, you can see the, cha the, the uh, impact on the social, economic, environmental performance. Uh, we are now incorporating a more sophisticated um, model into this. Uh, this looks a little overwhelming, but it's actually pretty simple to understand. You have the the population, how many people are living in Kendall community? 42,000 people commute in every day. That's not very functional. Then we can look at these eight key interventions. I'll go through some of those in a minute. 
We can look at the impact on energy consumption, CO2 emissions. We can look at a fine-grained view of the social, economic, environmental performance. Finally, we can look at the sources of energy and uh, what the mix of energy sources on, are on the grid, which, by the way, in Kendall Square, 78 percent, something in that order, uh, fossil fuel. So let's take a minute and just go through these interventions. And by the way, just another way to look at it. So this is the bubble <laughs> that shows 17.19 tons of CO2 per person, right? Remember, we have to get down to 2.5. And so we're, I'm going to go through these interventions, and we'll see how close we get. So we can start with electric vehicles and renewables to the grid. These are kind of the conventional uh, sustainable approaches. And uh, so we took the MIT transportation survey. We know where people live, their commuting modes. We calculate something like three tons of carbon just for commuting, more than the total should be. Then we said, what happens if everybody draw, uh, drives an electric vehicle? What would happen then? So here in our model, we can dial electric vehicles up to 100% and see the impact in these different dimensions. Okay, so we're starting with 17.19, and we can shrink that down a bit, 15.5. That's not bad, but you won't save the planet through renewable power to the grid and electric vehicles alone. So let's look at hybrid work. So we, during, before the pandemic, work was mainly centered in the office. We're now moving to a much more complex pattern of the workplace as a network. People are working in homes and co-working and, and um, Starbucks, et cetera. Maybe that has a, an impact on CO2 emissions that are significant. We dial that up to 100%, and we find in our model doesn't really do much because people use more air conditioning. They drive more locally. So what about deep retrofit of buildings, high-performance architecture? So we'll try that. We'll look at electrifying buildings, high-performance, HVAC, insulation, new windows, et cetera. So we dial that up. And by the way, if you look at where I've circled there in the upper left, those previous interventions had very little social, very little economic impact. You get a little bit better impact from buildings, better ventilation, helps with public health, et cetera. Okay, so now we are introducing both hybrid work and high-performance buildings. Now we're down to 14.3. Still have a long ways to go. Live work symmetry. So we said, well, rather than people commuting by electric vehicle, what if we get rid of the cars they're using for commuting? We have we build enough housing on this site so people can live near where they work. And so we can now dial that up to 100%. Now that's pretty extreme because now you're building housing for literally everyone that works at Kendall Square. And you have a pretty significant positive social, environmental, economic impact. But we can even do better. We can now provide all of the amenities that people need locally. So we do a lot of work with telecom data. So uh, using sources of, of data like Replica or Safecraft. And we can, we can determine the patterns of behavior, the assets that people access daily, um, their frequency, et cetera. This is a list of some of those. But in Kendall Square, everything with a red X is not, um, is not accessible. <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, such amenity in Kendall Square. So now we can look at different ways of providing walkable access to all the amenities that people need in Kendall Square in a walkable distance. This is modeling um, access from buildings, including the travel time in elevators. Or we can, uh, if we're doing community engagement, we can build these layers and layers of simulation where, in this case, red is bad, green is good, and she's, in this case, adding a park to turn an area into providing walkable access to parks. And we can think about strategies that could actually encourage the landowners, the real estate developers, to provide these pro-social assets like affordable housing amenities. Um, could be a community endowment that's used to subsidize housing, for example. So you allow a developer to build a taller building, but that increased value that the city 
is granting to that landowner has to be used in large part for pro-social activities. So we build a model where we could look at different scenarios and the feedback mechanisms to create a kind of a self-regulating algorithmic dynamic zoning system and, and showed if we did it right, we've no, nobody's ever done this, we could achieve something like what we call civic homeostasis. So now let's dial up walkable access to amenities to their maximum. So everybody has everything they need within a walking distance. And we start with 14.3 tons of carbon. Where do we end up? Well, that makes a huge difference. Now we're down to 8.45. We're a long ways towards our goal. We can also look at hyper-efficient places of living. So we've been working on this. This goes back to 2013 where we thought, well, it's a little silly in, a, in an expensive urban apartment to have both a bedroom and a living room. One's empty during the day, the other's empty at night. So let's convert a living room into a bedroom dynamically or a dining table on demand, an office on demand. These were ideas we had a long time ago. Then we like to build things. So um, these kind of renderings are easy to do. In this case, Figuring out the architectural robotics to dynamically transform a space is complicated. We built this in our lab over at the Media Lab where the bed drops down from the ceiling and walls can move. Then we build a, a little more complex uh, apartment uh, uh, upstairs in the Media Lab where you have a queen size bed on demand, you have an office on demand. This is only 19 square meters. Now you have a dining room for six people or um, a, a living room for six people, a tiny little bathroom, like an, like an airplane bathroom that opens up for a walk-in, handicap accessible bath and shower, et cetera. Anyway, the point is you have to think as an architect, I'm an architect, you have to think four dimensionally. You have to think in terms of time in addition to three dimensions. People thought that was kind of a crazy idea, but we launched a company. Uh, we, we got Google, Alphabet, and um, Ikea to fund it. And now we have these transformable products in 50 cities in North America in over 100 buildings. So you see this young woman wakes up in the morning, she's making coffee, and the, the bed just auto-magically transforms into uh, a couch and bedroom into a living room. So we're working on different strategies. This, this is particularly useful for very tiny micro apartments, but you can use the same strategies for a penthouse. This is a, a complete apartment where you have a transformable kitchen and a walk-in closet on demand. And we're looking at having tiny little apartments that function as effectively as an apartment that's twice that size, a micro, a studio, a one bedroom, a two bedroom. And basically, you're, you, you can have the same functionality with half the square footage, half the embodied energy, half the operational energy if you do it right. This is a, an apartment in New York that some random person just shot a video of and posted it on Tic Tac. I like this video, so I grabbed it. So I think his name is there to give him credit for the video. <laughs> but then we can go back to our CityScope platform and we can move these optically tagged Lego bricks around and you're moving not only function, but you're moving people. So if you're moving micro units, you're, you may be moving young single professionals or young couples or families with young children, etc. Okay, so now we dial this compact housing up to 100%. Now, every apartment, it's a little extreme, every apartment in the whole area is transformable. What might that do? So we start with 8.454 tons, and what did we get to? 8.2. Okay, not a huge environmental impact, but the social impact actually is quite large because you're increasing the diversity and affordability of housing in the central cities. Lightweight community scale mobility. We, we've been working on this in this area for over 12 years. So this is um, the city car that folded, used very little space, had robot wheels, front egress. It's a great project, 
It's filmed in Vitoria, Spain. When we finished it, though, I said, it's still a car. We need to do even lighter modes for, for cities. So we, we tried to figure out how to bring the best features of bike share with Uber, ride share, together into a, a single vehicle. We call it a persuasive electric vehicle. It operates a little bit like a social robot in the city because it needs to interact naturally with humans. We then built, um, right before the pandemic, a little more sophisticated version. Here you call for it on your phone, comes to you wherever you are. You hop in it, drive it under your own control unless you're disabled or, or elderly because you, you want people to get exercise. They go a little faster if it's under their control. And now we're working on a strategy where it moves people during peak hours and then packages off peak, do take out food delivery. And um, we'll see where that goes. Now, Naroa, who's sitting right here, then worked on an even lighter mode. It's a bicycle you ride, like a conventional bicycle that dynamically converts into a tricycle and now it goes on its way autonomously to pick up the next person. Anyway, there's lots of ideas for these micro-mobility modes. The point is, if you have a compact community where people live and work, you don't need cars anymore. You need these lighter weight modes. And um, we then can do all kinds of simulation. This is comparing our autonomous micro-mobility to station-based bike sharing to the dockless bike sharing. and it seems like you could probably provide a high level of service with uh, much fewer vehicles and if properly commercialized, I, the whole system may be cost effective. So we dial that up to 100% and we can see the impact. Okay, so we're 8.2 tons now. Where do you think we'll end up? Not so great. 8.17. But again, the social impact is really tremendous because if you have a walkable community, you need to have mechanized mobility service for children and carrying packages and the like. Okay, low carbon diet and local production. Now, many people don't realize that the typical American diet is well over three, uh, two and a half, the two and a half tons that is our total global target. And mostly that's from from eating meat. If you go to a plant-based diet and if we can deploy local production, we can get it down somewhere below 1.5. Now, some years ago, we did the city farm project in our lab where we're, we were looking at urban agriculture. This is hydroponics, or in this case, aeroponics, to grow vegetables locally. There's now this whole explosion of high-performance robotic agriculture, industrialized agricultural systems and I think it's perfectly feasible to produce high-quality produce near the point of consumption with very little waste and, 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 and much higher quality. And, of course, there's all kinds of new, new possibilities like growing meat in a lab. So I think, I, I'm, I'm thinking 20 years we'll look back on this time when we ate a lot of animals as, as kind of a, an odd time because be there'll be a lot of alternatives to that. So now we can, we can dial that local production up to 100%. We start from 8.18 into 6.78. So we actually get more benefit there from electric vehicles and, a, and, a, and, a, and solar energy to the grid, just from changing the diet and local production. Okay, sources of energy. That's taking all of the energy consumption down as low as possible, but we still have to make up the energy, right? So a lot of people are fascinated with solar farms and upgrading the grid. I've, I'm personally skeptical that we'll be able to power many cities this way. A lot of it is because of the difficulties in getting right-of-ways for transmission lines for both power and, and new mobility systems like Hyperloop, for example. Um, if we, in fact, if we cover every surface in Kendall Square with photovoltaics, it hardly moves the needle because it's high, it's high enough density. There's just not enough photons falling on the surface to do much. You'd have to have vast solar farms outside of the city, and there's no land in a place like Boston. We're, we're actually very interested in this new mass-produced nuclear technology, like nuclear batteries, that can be delivered on the back of a truck, and a few of these could could power a community like MIT Kendall if we lower the demand considerably like we're talking about. Ultimately, 
the energy source should be, should be uh, fusion. And MIT has a spin-off company, Commonwealth, broke ground on a, on a, new, um, a, a new reactor. This is an animation that the group put out just showing these, these uh, amazing um, superconducting magnets that contain the, uh, the fusion source. And uh, so we're, we're, we're thinking about, well, what it, would, what it would take to create fusion-ready cities so when that kind of power is available, you just plug it in. You just swap out the heat source. And so if we could do that, we go from a little over 6.5 down to 5.94. So those are our hyperlocal solutions to global challenges, <laughs> all right? You notice we didn't make it down to two and a half. It's still, it's still almost six. So the rest of that, oh, by the way, this is kind of a, a quick analysis of the social and the, and the economic impact. You see electric vehicles, almost nothing socially, economically, but it's the local jobs, the housing near jobs, the local amenities, things like that, the diet that has the, the biggest impact beyond environmental. Okay, the remaining is, uh, needs to be dealt with outside of the community. That's like air travel, uh, durable goods, uh, internet service, server farms, all of that. That's beyond our scope. We're dealing with enough, so somebody else is going to have to think about those problems. Consensus. I want to quickly talk about this. So it's, it's relatively easy for us to identify what we should do. The question is how to get there, how to bring people along. So that's why we build these city scope platforms, these tangible interfaces that um, allow groups of people to go through a process of debate and and exploration, running different scenarios. We think of this as extended in intelligence. So you're allowing humans to do what they do best, but you're using all this sophisticated technology to augment the intelligence of, of the human. And one of my favorite projects that we've done in terms of consensus building is, is in Hamburg, Germany, where we worked with Olaf Scholz, who was then the mayor of Hamburg. He's now the chancellor of Germany. Uh, he wanted us to help him think about the community for the 2024 Olympics. He lost the referendum on the Olympics at the same time they were hit with an influx of, they were expecting 80,000 refugees from the war in Syria. They were housed in these temporary shelters. I asked the mayor, what's the big problem? And he says, working with the communities to find the sites to build the housing. This is the conventional community engagement process. It's very contentious. The angriest voices are, are the most impactful in these sessions. We wanted to flip that on its head. So we built these city scope platforms where groups from the community could come and collectively explore different alternatives. They put a little square on a table of a color-coded map. It created a, a city scope table with, the, with these optically tagged Lego pieces. So I could move housing to one side. Somebody else could say, no, this is better. We see the feedback, access to jobs and housing, et cetera. At the end of the session, the table looked something like this and then everybody would go back and debate, and actually all of the districts were, in effect, competing to accommodate the most refugees. It was actually quite a beautiful thing to see. Uh, it made it more creative and cooperative than contentious. This was an article in The Atlantic magazine, Germany's radical pro-refugee urban planning experiment, but it was really more of a consensus building experiment. And from our conversation, Yesterday in Concepcion, I think these kind of next generation community engagement consensus building platforms could be useful. Anyway, we've built these all over the world. Uh, we now have uh, relationships in, in, in nine cities. And every place is different. Every place has its own problems. I look forward to learning more about what the, the challenges and opportunities are in, um, in Chile. And we're also, we're often asked, well, what do we do about new communities? So uh, this is just some preliminary work we're doing for a new science neighborhood in Kharkiv. So if we're starting from scratch, we can start with an optimized radar plot, you know, 
with, with, you know, we can set as a goal perfect harmony in the community. And uh, the process that we use is something like this. We start out conventionally, it's all using human intelligence. You know, what are the constraints, the opportunities? We do sketches, and then we can bring it into a more of a generative system. So in this case, things are happening automatically to create that kind of harmony, housing in sync with jobs, et cetera. And then we can bring it into a more of a parametric system. Ultimately, this will be quite, quite automated. And then we can, in, in an automated way, using AI uh, generative systems, begin to explore possibilities for what the human experience might be. And um, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of this possibility. These are some studies I did in one day using these AI generative systems. If you see the little V in the plan, we're moving down a boulevard and, and getting a sense of what the experience of that place might be. Now we're in the main park where the university will be located, looking at co-working, uh, <clears throat> the gazebo in the center of the park, the um, commercial spaces and cafes, the university spaces. Now we're in the little residential square with uh, uh, a gazebo in that square, the view to the square, uh, residential laneway, even narrower laneway, the grove of trees that we're planting around the metro, switchyard, this residential laneway that connects to that. Now we're down um, at the edge of the river, the Kharkiv River, with the boathouse on the river and a gazebo in the park and the metro station. Anyway, these at this point are more for fun, but I think we will be able to very quickly to tie that more directly to these generative design and modeling systems. We'll talk about this if you're able to attend at the Climate Tech Conference that we're partnering with Technology Review uh, October 12th and 13th. And then following that is our City Science Summit that we're doing in collaboration with Norman Foster, who's the patron of cities to the UN. So we're collaborating with him on this archive design. At that summit, we'll have an opportunity to drill down much deeper into these issues. And I just want to welcome the Chamber of Construction, the Cor Corporacion Ciudades, the government of Bio Bio, as our newest member of the City Science Network. Thank you all.